afternoon and welcome to the Your Town radio and television program on historic AM 1240 KNRY and AMPS Access Monterey Peninsula Cable Channel 24. Every weekday at 5 o'clock, we're proud to have as our guests various local civic and community leaders. The purpose of the program is to help inform listeners and viewers like you about some of the things going on in your town. And now, on with the program. Welcome to Your Town Radio and Television Program. I'm John Sanders, Special Collections Manager of the Naval Postgraduate School's Dudley Knox Library, your host each second Tuesday of the month. Tonight's guests include experts who are specialists in national defense education programs, Monterey Navy League leaders, and an historical reenactor with the Center for Living History. Our first guest, Dr. Knox Millsaps, chairman of the Naval Postgraduate School's uh, Mechanical, Astronautical, and Engineering Program, an executive agent for a program nicknamed SMART, and Deborah Shifflett, the program manager for SMART. Knox and Deborah, welcome to your town. Thank you, John, for having us on. Uh, the Naval Postgraduate School is executive agent for this truly significant national defense education program that's called SMART. Uh, that acronym stands for Science, Mathematics, and Research for Transformation. It's a scholarship for service program, and involved in this or participating in this is the American Society for Engineering Education. Why was NPS chosen to be executive agent of this particular type of scholarship program? And how did the program actually come about? Well, uh, first of all, the need for the program was determined uh, probably about 10 years ago. There were several studies that the defense workforce, the civilians, not the people in uniform, but the civilians, were aging. And there was a study about six, seven years ago that said uh, within uh, five years, a third of the defense, civilian, science, and engineering workers would be eligible for retirement. And so that was of some concern. And so this program was started. There was legislation. It went through the Congress. Uh, and in 2006, uh, legislation uh, authorized this program to go forward in a permanent fashion. Uh, Kind of during this time, the, uh, our provost, uh, Dr. Leonard Ferrari and Peter Perdue, are really the people that uh, had the vision that NPS would be really the perfect organization to become the executive agent for this. And they um, put in a proposal, and uh, people really liked it. Uh, we have the connection to the defense lab, but we're also a university, and so the real uh, goal here is to bring people from universities into the defense science research establishment. So it's kind of this nexus between uh, our position as a defense organization and as an educational um, institution that really allows us to bring these two communities together. And so I think that's really one of the reasons that it's an ideal place. And so as you say, we run this program for the entire country. Well, when you talk about uh, national intellectual capacity, uh, turnover of about one-third of the workforce is a very significant uh, transition period. Is, would you agree? <laughs> or, uh, or um, yeah, the Department of Defense is very worried about the number of senior scientists and engineers leaving, and it's the hope that this cadre of students that we're bringing in over the next five to ten years will replenish that intellectual capacity. Yeah, the magnitude of the problem is fairly significant, that uh, people don't realize how many civilians work for the Defense Department. There are about 700,000 civilians that work for the Defense Department, uh, 100,000 or more are scientists, engineers, mathematicians working in various technical fields. So it's a huge workforce out there. And so in order to draw that many people is uh, really a challenge. But it's really necessary because people really are retiring in great numbers. We have uh, organizations that need to hire a 1,000 engineers in the next year or two. It's a rather daunting task, but we're helping quite a bit, and they're happy that we're they are giving scholarships and uh, um, helping them develop their workforce. 
Well, what type of candidates uh, do you really look for when you screen student applications um, for the scholarship program? Okay. Well, first of all, uh, this is a um, program at undergraduate and graduate level, so we have uh, people pursuing bachelor's degrees, master's degrees, and PhDs. It's a recruitment and retention program, so we can bring people from universities directly into the Defense Department, but also people who are currently working for the Defense Department are eligible to apply, and so it's both recruitment and retention. Uh, we like to think we are going for the best and brightest people in the universities, that uh, we have over 3,000 applications and we only take about 300 a year into the program. So it's the top 10 percent, and just to qualify uh, is fairly difficult. So it's the top 10 percent of an already uh, fairly uh, elite group. Absolutely. Do you review each of the applications yourselves? We've, we have a panel of about 200 people who come together every year to review the applications. Um, each application is read multiple times and again they're really looking for the best and the brightest in each discipline that we fund in. Yeah. The applicants have to put in transcripts, they have to have letters of recommendation, resumes, their graduate students, uh, graduate record exams, etc. So it's a fairly complete uh, uh, dossier they put forward into the uh, application porthole. It's, everything's done online these days and w we meet together in groups of 20, 30 people in discipline areas, mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, aerospace physics, and each uh, candidate gets uh, three reads and we score them. And so it's a fairly uh, rigorous process for them to uh, get into the pool and to make the top part of that and to be selected in the program. Yeah, that's, that's impressive. You have a great website, and uh, so that's really your portal for the application process. Um, if people are interested in going to that website, how do they find you on the web? Um, they would find us through um, www.asee.org slash smart, and we have uh, a lot of program information on the website. In addition um, to that, that is our application portal. Our application cycle opens August 1st and runs through December 1st, and that's where people would go to both find out more about the program and apply. How many universities now participate in the SMART scholarship program, and how do you match up students with these institutions? We have about 200, we have students at about 210 universities nationwide, and we don't match students to their universities. If awarded one of our scholarships, students can go to any accredited U.S. college or institution. It's their choice. You know, uh, as Deborah said, we have over 200 universities represented, but uh, one of the things that we're very proud of is uh, some of the best universities of the country are the top um, place where we have smart fellows, Georgia Tech, Penn State, uh, MIT, Stanford, Michigan, Texas A&M, um, and on down the line. So they're really concentrated at very good schools. Uh, these are institutions that have very rigorous standards in their own selection process. So they probably apply those very same standards mm -hmm. to the smart uh, yeah. applicants as well. The applicants have to uh, get into the university that they're applying to, but they also have to, for the funding, uh, make the cut in the SMART program. So it's kind of a, a double jeopardy for them in terms of that. 